I have been forwarded many articles, but none more than a recent essay in The Atlantic. In The Golden Age of American Jews is Ending, journalist Franklin Foer argues that the social liberalism most American Jews, Democrat and Republican, supported over the country's two and a half centuries a liberalism we hoped would open opportunities for us by putting to rest discrimination in all its forms, ultimately failed to defeat anti-Semitism and now has broken down altogether. The 20th century saw great advancement of Jews' acceptance in America. But as the 21st century dawned, old prejudices rose again and old canards shape-shifted into new threats. While the months since October 7th have thrown these dangers into sharp relief, we know anti-Jewish hatred was well on the rise long before the onslaught of anti-Semitism that followed Hamas's barbaric attack on Israel. Anti-Zionism was already rampant on college campuses, manipulated by forces on the left to alienate and bully Jewish students, a rise in nativist politics, which forward links to the 2016 presidential campaign, unleashed rhetorical and physical assaults by white nationalists and replacement theorists like Robert Bowers, who murdered 11 at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue. Decades ago, academics at prominent universities we're already demonizing Israel as a colonialist apartheid state, delegitimizing it as the ancestral home of the Jewish people, and claiming Jews close to the presidency were bending American foreign policy to Jewish interests, a calumny more recently echoed by Ilhan Omar and other progressives in Congress. And in the aftermath of the 2007-2008 financial crisis, and the Madoff Ponzi scheme, the myth of the Jewish banker running and bleeding the economy awakened to new receptivity. But even with all these dark realities, Foer's conclusion that our time in the sun is setting needs to be contested, if only for our own hope in brighter days. Foer profiles educator and philosopher Horace Callum. Born in Silesia in 1882, Callan immigrated to the United States to attend Harvard. Pressed to assimilate for the full advantages of being American, he refused. Callan maintained that America, at its best, was a mixing of cultures and ethnicities. The hyphen in Jewish American, Irish American, Italian American, was what gave the country its creativity and drive, he argued. Our own Strausses and Lehmans are proof. From their ranks rose leaders in commerce and government, and the temples they and others constructed signaled their pride in helping build America. These synagogues of the 19th and 20th centuries Americanized Judaism and assisted the Jewish community's integration into American life. We went, not all, but most of us, from becoming European Jews, where our Jewishness was our inescapable defining identity, to becoming Jewish Americans. In our desire to make it here, Collectively, we placed our universalistic aspirations ahead of our particularistic Jewish concerns, believing liberty and justice for all would be enough to protect and sustain us. Our faith in American liberalism was not matched by an equal emphasis on the preservation of our own unique traditions and history. From Reform Judaism's beginnings in 19th century Western Europe and America, its adherents were encouraged to set Jewish peoplehood aside in favor of their new national identities. 
But events would soon prove that acculturation into Europe's supposedly enlightened societies could not defeat the hatred of Jews that quartered there. The rise of National Socialism in Germany is a late example. At the turn of the century, Alfred Dreyfus, a loyal French officer and by most accounts an assimilated Jew, was framed as scapegoat for another man's crime and convicted of treason. That trial convinced one journalist covering it, Theodore Herzl, that neither assimilation nor liberalism alone or in combination would guarantee Jews safety. Herzl's solution was to found a sovereign Jewish state. And the fact of Israel's existence gives us power over our people's destiny we never possessed before. But modern Zionism is not only an expression of Jewish nationalism. It is also an assertion of the Jewish people's right to survive and thrive independent of any other nation's liberal largesse. It is a declaration that while Jews should continue to support a universalistic agenda, we simultaneously, independently, need to guard our own self-interests. And it is an insight recommending a more particularistic approach to certain societal concerns in America today. Consider just one example, free speech. Liberalism prioritizes freedom of expression as a cornerstone of democracy. But should that First Amendment right be used to justify harassment of Jews on college campuses? Or does such harassment fall within the Supreme Court's 1942 exception for fighting words? Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act should protect Jewish students and those thought to be from any form of discrimination, including harassment, at institutions receiving federal funds. Even before October 7th, a concern existed at many colleges and universities for the safety of Jewish students. But what we have witnessed since then is shocking. Not just the defense of Hamas as freedom fighters, but a rejoicing in their atrocities and a rallying to their side with hateful rhetoric defended on grounds of free speech and free academic inquiry, as if the intimidation and fear felt by Jews did not undermine those very freedoms. In a similar vein, an unnuanced approach to free speech would decry a ban of TikTok, as the ACLU has. But given TikTok's dissemination of anti-Semitic propaganda, Jewish groups such as the Jewish Federations of North America support the congressional bill that could trigger the ban. Make no mistake, I support the ACLU. And we should continue to fight for the universalistic ideals rooted in Jewish tradition. We just can't assume our Jewish interests will automatically be protected by them. Gathered in Pittsburgh in 1885, the Central Conference of American Rabbis proclaimed, we consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community. In 1935, in defiance of his predecessors, Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver countered, it is the total program of Jewish life and destiny which the religious leaders of our people should stress today. The religious and moral values, the universal concepts, the mandate of mission, as well as the Jewish people itself and all its national aspirations. Silver's predecessors had been wrong, historically and strategically. Jews have never been only a religious community. Sociologist Emil Durkheim recognized that religion only emerges out of the collective effervescence of a group already linked in close association. We were first and have always been a people. And we know this to be true. Were it not the case, recent events in Israel would not pain us as they do. We would not have experienced this almost 
tribal instinct to circle the wagons that has given us such strength over these past months. Even those of us who are generations removed from the tight-knit communities of the shtetl, even those who have chosen Judaism on their own, understand in our guts that Judaism is about Jews. The events of the last months have not just tugged on our collective heartstrings, they have tightened them. The Jewish community in America is bound together now in ways it has not been since the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago, Israel's last existential crisis. Many who had become Jewish Americans have returned to being American Jews. And if we can make something of that shift, if we can maintain our universalistic commitments without sacrificing our own particularistic concerns, then we can become not just an example of a minority that made it in America, but one that celebrates its distinctiveness as an example to every other minority in this country. Mr. Foer's article should serve as an admonition, but not an epitaph. The most potent response to those who would do us harm will always be a full-hearted embrace of Jewish activism, Jewish worship, Jewish learning, Jewish celebration, Jewish culture, and Jewish pride. On Rosh Hashanah, I acknowledged Schwer zu sein Yid. It is hard to be a Jew. I had no idea then how hard the following months would be. But what I said then, I still believe. I wouldn't trade places with anybody. And I wouldn't trade congregations with anybody either. Look at ours, approaching 180 years old. The builders of this magnificent sanctuary quite literally sought to establish the New York City Jewish community as equal to all and second to none. Here we lift up our unique Jewish identity to celebrate it and educate about it. If once we acculturated Jews into American life, today we welcome Americans into Jewish life. And when anti-Semites from the left and right threaten us with days of hate, we take our worship services out on Fifth Avenue to proclaim to all we will not be cowed. That spirit and pride emanates from all of you, the many who attend our programs and our worship services in person and online, and especially from those who roll up their sleeves to lead and create and inspire. And tonight we are honoring them, our volunteers. It is so meaningful that we choose this night to do so because we happen to be reading the conclusion of the book of Exodus describing the building and completion of the tabernacle, the Israelites' portable sanctuary. As you know, the Israelites are commanded to bring gifts for its construction. All whose hearts so move them should contribute according to their means and interest. Only because of the generosity of the Israelite people, not because they were required to give, but because they were moved to give, was that temple in the desert built. Only because of the generosity of spirit of our volunteers does our temple accomplish what it does. And so tonight, we honor you, our builders, whether by serving on our board of trustees, or stewarding our finances and physical plant, or guiding our worship, educational, and cultural programming, or shepherding our social justice and philanthropic commitments, or so much more. These men and women, younger and older, light and carry high the flame that enables us to shine our temple's messages of welcome and of hope. And to invite them up to the bima so that we can salute them, I would call on the one who leads them, whose exemplary presidency we will celebrate in May, my wonderful partner and friend, Harris Diamond. So as I get ready to call everybody up,
you know, I'm reminded of what Rabbi Davidson said about our 180th year and how much all of you, including those who are online with us tonight, have done with us. To just give you some example, over just this last year, we had 400 worship services, both in presence and online. 600,000, 600,000 people joined us on the High Holy Days. 2.2 million people, or 2.2 million views is a better way of saying, of our services took place. We have people who attend services from 95 countries, 5,000 young unaffiliated Jews between the ages of 21 and 39 have come in the last year to our special services for them. 11,000 people attended just two weeks ago our services on, and our lecture series on anti-Semitism. And we have 200 new family households and two new members tonight that we're so proud to celebrate with. 150 new young members 52 Sundays out of 52 Sundays where we served our Sunday lunch program to those who were in need. And all of this is bound on by the volunteers and the clergy led by our senior rabbi, Rabbi Joshua Davidson. And so before he celebrates us, I think we should celebrate all of our clergy and our choir and thank them. And now I get the joy of calling a long list of folks to come up. So as I call the group, if any of you are here from that group, would you please join us on the Bema? First, the Board of Trustees, my partners. So any trustees, please come up with us. Second, our Audit Committee, who makes the Board of Trustees feel really good each year when they tell us we got a clean audit from our outside auditors. Our ESIC Committee, our Finance Committee, our House Committee, our Human Resources Committee, our Investment Committee, our Membership Committee, our Nominating Committee, our Ritual Community Committee, our Cemetery Committee, our Governance Committee, our Campus Master Plan Committee, and our Nursery School Committee. Folks from our Board of Trustees, thank you so much for your partnership and help in leading our congregation. But we can't forget our nursery school committee, our book fair, our mitzvah committee, our new family welcome, our hala coordinators, the treasurer for the nursery school committee, our nursery school merchandise coordinators, guest speaker coordinators, teacher appreciation committee. We didn't have that when I was in school. A movie night committee, our social and our parents association presidents of our nursery school and our religious school our pension committee, our philanthropic fund committee, our religious school committee. And yes, if you're wondering, this is an advertisement of all the things you can join as the new year begins to dawn on us. Our striker center committee, our Tikkun alum committee, our ushers committee, our young families committee, our men's club, and our sunset service readers panel. That is always here and reads from our traditional liturgy. The Women of Emmanuel, our Ronald McDonald House volunteers, our Emmanuel Center for Seniors, and each year our Veterans Party, and each year where we celebrate our veterans. Our Second Seder Committee, our Passover Homebound Delivery Group, our Thanksgiving Dinner Volunteers, Stitch in Time, Shabbat service greeters, our museum volunteers and our archive volunteers. And when you're 180 years old, you have a lot in your museum and a lot in our archive. And I'd encourage anybody who has some time during the week to stop by, a lot of fascinating things to see. Our Sunday lunch committee, our young members circle, 20s and 30s. Our teen volunteers who just last week were in beautiful services. Our midnight run, our teen philanthropic committee, our A-team volunteers. The well, our calling generations, 
and one that's particularly warm to my heart because they hit all of you in your pocketbook, our Development Committee Task Force. Without the support of each and every one of the folks who are up here and the support of everybody in our congregation, we would not be able to serve the thousands of members, the 600,000 people who join us for High Holy Day services, and so many people who are in need in this city where our volunteers reach out to them, whether they are homeless, whether they are elderly and shut in, whether they are young and need a mentorship. There is so much our temple does, so much to be proud of. And so, Rabbi Davidson, this is your group. <laughs> Our group. Please rise. And those of you on the bima, come face the ark. Come closer. Come on over so that those just coming up the steps can get in, too. Eloheinu velohe avotenu ve'imotenu, our God and God of our ancestors. We ask your blessing upon this great and holy congregation. May it ever advance the highest ideals of our faith and ever be a home for those in need of comfort and strength. And on this night especially, we ask your blessing upon these, our congregation's builders who have given so much to us, the gifts of their hearts, the gifts of their time, the gifts of their love. May they know the depth of our gratitude to them. May they continue to find fulfillment in their service to this temple, to the Jewish people, to you, O oh God, and to this world. May they inspire the rest of us to shoulder our share of the burden to stand beside them. And may they continue to lead us for what we pray are many, many years to come. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'yichunecha, Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. We join in our prayer of thanksgiving, our Shehechianu. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehechianu Vekimanu Vehigianu Lazman Hazeh Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehechianu Vekimanu Man has heard.